morning. You guys look beautiful. The beauty of the Lord is upon you this morning in your praise and your worship. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this season that we're in, that our hearts are turned towards you and remembering and recognizing in all that we do the gift of your son. Lord, as we come this morning, let our words bring forth the life and the love of your Holy Spirit. Let the hearts of those that are here be touched this morning by you, Father God, to break through into the lives, into the situations, Father God, that need it this morning, Lord. Let us draw closer to you and hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so yes, today we're talking about the candle of love. You know, Jesus came in his ministry to proclaim, declare, and demonstrate God's kingdom. To, and part of that, of course, is the love of the Father. And he was coming to a people who had, to a large part, just lost the connection with the Father's heart and the Father's love, and what that it looked like. And so Jesus, in this morning, what we want to share with you is what does the Father's love look like? What, is, what do we need to do to be able to receive it? And then how does that look activated in our lives? So I want to start kind of at the beginning, near the beginning of Jesus's public ministry where he went into the temple in Nazareth to proclaim that the kingdom of God was at hand, to declare that. But before we get there, I want to provide a little bit of context. So kind of back up from there, what was probably a few months earlier, where Jesus had gone to John the Baptist. He was baptized into the Jordan River. He came up, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. He was then, well, the voice from heaven declared, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tempted in all manners by the enemy. He resisted, he passed. And then he came out of the wilderness and came to declare God's kingdom was at hand. So what I want to point out is that this progression of events in many ways is you can see a mirror image or a reverse of the story in Genesis of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you look back, you have Adam and Eve who are created by God, and they are put, they are placed in the garden, which is God's kingdom. They're starting in God's kingdom. In the midst of that, the enemy comes in and tempts them. They fail, and they are sent out of the garden into the wilderness. And Jesus comes and goes into the wilderness, is tempted passes and comes out of the wilderness and declares the kingdom is at hand. He is restoring that which had been lost. And I say that to say, yes, the, the Father's love is and always, it is consistent. We sang about it this morning. It's enduring. It's a covenant that is unchanging. And while Maybe, well, we have lost our connection to that at times. The people of Israel had lost their connection to that. The Father's love was there for them 
And Jesus was coming to declare that. And so in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 were what Jesus came into the synagogue there in Nazareth, and he stood and he read this portion. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So Jesus announces the kingdom and what that brings. So at a prophetic training this fall, um, when I use that word prophetic, I want a bunny trail here for just a minute because there may be some who that word is maybe, I don't know, kind of intimidating. And it's really just hearing God's voice. And I want to mention too, we have a, a class that's starting in January. It's about prophetic training, learning to hear God's voice better. Contact me later if you want to know more about that. But we were given a scripture to meditate on in class, and it was Isaiah 61 in the Passion Translation. It says, The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is wrapped around me because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell captives you are free, and to tell prisoners be free from your darkness. I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies, to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen those crushed by despair who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful bouquet in place of ashes, the oil of bliss instead of tears, and the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness, planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. So we were encouraged then to meditate on it and write what we heard the Lord say. And here's what I wrote. I am wrapped around you, my daughter, but not just to sit. Remember the sit-go sign? Are you able to display that? So years ago, we would spend Friday nights at the House of Prayer worshiping. And the front of the building that we were in was just covered with windows like this one, but we could see them from where we were worshiping. And there was a gas station immediately across the street, and it was a sit-go. And I don't think I ever, in all the years there, I don't think ever the sit was lit up. It was only ever the go. And the Lord was reminding me just recently of this word he'd given me is that, yes, it's great to sit in his presence, but we are to go. So starting back over, this word, he says, I am wrapped around you, my daughter. And I'm sharing this with you because this isn't just for me. I believe it's for all of us. I'm wrapped around you, but not just to sit. I've wrapped you to empower you to go. There's a world that needs me, and you, you, you are one of my glory carriers. Carry my love, carry my joy, and my deliverance to them for me. So as Rob just shared, Jesus has brought God's kingdom and a restoration of that which had been lost. He's entrusted us to share this message that he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus came to declare and demonstrate what that love would look like. So this morning, I wanted to share with you a story you're familiar with. At the first part from the parable of the prodigal son, but I'm going to share it a little bit differently this morning. I'm going to kind of give a modern version, if you will, of, of that story that maybe uh, would re, you would relate to a little bit, bit more. So, as we know, there's a man, he has two sons. 
And so one day the younger son comes to his father and says, I'm tired of waiting for my inheritance. I want what's mine. So his father loves him, but decides he splits up his estate and gives to the younger son what he's asked for. And it's not too many days later after that, the younger son decides, you know what? I don't want to live in my father's house anymore. I have what I need now. All I really need is his wealth. I'm leaving. I'm moving out of state, away from here to a big city. So that's what he does. He moves off to a big city and begins to spend his money foolishly. Buys, rents the biggest apartment in the high rise, gets fancy cars, spends money on front row tickets and backstage passes to the biggest concerts and sporting events. He hosts lavish parties with illicit substances and promiscuity. He goes to the most exclusive clubs and restaurants and fancy parties. And of course, it wouldn't be complete if he wasn't posting about it on social media where everybody knew about it and could like and give the thumbs up. You know, it's the ultimate social media life. But after some time, that money ran ran out. He found himself for the first time in his life in need and hungry. And it was also about that time, the dot-com bubble burst, the stock market crash, the housing market collapsed, Inflation skyrocketed, some crypto market collapsed, a pandemic broke out, and there was no toilet paper on the store shelves. In short, his situation had gone from bad to worse. He struggled to find any way to have a job, to earn any money. And the only thing he could find was an off-the-books job working in the back of a dingy restaurant where he cleaned dishes in a room filled with rodents and insects. And he was so hungry, the food that he had scraped into the trash bin began to look appetizing to him. And in this moment, he had a moment of clarity and came to his senses. He said, all of my father's employees have more than enough to eat. I am going to go back to my father, and I will say to him, What I did to you and how I lived was wrong. I'm not worthy to be your son, but would you just hire me as one of your employees? And so that's what he did. He got up from that place he was in, he left, and he returned back home. Now, as he was coming home, but still a ways off, his father saw him coming. His father got up and ran to him and had compassion upon him and embraced and kissed him. And his son began to say, Father, I was wrong what I did to you, how I lived my life. I'm not worthy to be called your son, would? And his father just cut him off and told the servants, get him clean clothes, get him a bath, get him the robe, get him shoes, get him a ring. Go and prepare a feast of our best food and drink. We are going to celebrate and rejoice for my son who was dead is alive. He who is lost 
is found. And they went and celebrated the return of the son. So what did the father's love look like in this? The father's heart, the father was sitting, watching, and looking. It tells us in 2 Chronicles, the father's eyes, the Lord's eyes, roam the earth looking for those whose hearts are turned to him so that he can strengthen them. And that's what this father was doing, was he was looking. And when he saw his son, he had compassion on him. He ran to him where he was, and he brought him in. His son's expectation, his son's highest expectation was maybe I can get a job working for my father. But his father was, no, you're my son. You've always been my son. My love has always been available to you. And now you're here, and I'm going to rejoice and celebrate in that. His son hadn't done anything to earn or deserve it, but his father welcomed him back in, embraced him, and and kissed him, and brought out those fresh clothes. He clothed him in righteousness that he had not earned. Now, what did the son do? to to receive, be able to be restored to the Father's love. Well, number one, he came to his senses. That's what it says. He came to his senses. He recognized the condition of the situation that he was in and that he needed to be back in the Father's house. Number two, he left the place he was. He went back. He took an action. He had to leave where he was and go back. And number three, he confessed that he was wrong. What we in the the church would use the word repent. He turned from what he had been doing, all of this, these steps. He turned from what he was doing. He recognized it was wrong. He turned and went in a different direction back to the Father where he was able to receive the Father's love. So the son was clothed in righteousness, better than being dressed in flannel. Matching flannel. (laughs) But what does it mean? It's a big word. A couple of weeks ago, that was the word of the week in kids' church. And I spent some time talking with Apostle Deb, like, how do we bring this down to four or five, six, eight-year-olds? And we came up with this phrase, made right in the sight of God. We also reminded the kids to let my love for Jesus shine like a light by doing good works. See, it's not the good works that make us righteous, but it's when we're righteous we want to do the good works. So in the new year, when our teaching team resumes Philippians, um, we'll get to chapter 3, so I won't spend a lot of time on it now. But in verse 8, the Apostle Paul wrote, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. In my research, I came across this statement by Martin Luther, which says the most damnable and pernicious, I know I tease Apostle Randy for using big words, pernicious means having a harmful effect. Heresy that has ever plagued the mind of man is that somehow he can make himself good enough to deserve to live forever with an all-holy God. You see, we can't do it. We cannot be right with God through our own works or deeds. But once we've been saved, made righteous, it wells up within us to share his love. Let our light shine. You see, our righteous acts in trying to get right with God are like filthy rags, dirt, garbage. But once we are dressed in his righteousness, those acts become our way of letting our light shine for Jesus. 
So what does it look like when our light shines? I want to go back to Isaiah 61. I'll start at the beginning of it to provide the context, but I want to read through this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the cloak of praise instead of a disheartened spirit. So here's where it turns a little bit. And now it's talking about us, talking about you. So you will be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Then you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the former devastations. And you will repair the ruined cities. The desolations of many generations. As we walk in the Father's love... This is what it looks like, first of all. Comfort, gladness, praise. But then our actions, as we walk this out, bring restoration and rebuilding of the things that have been lost. The things are gone. I skipped over a couple of verses in the middle of that, but it talks about how the Lord hates the thief and that a double portion will be restored of what has been stolen away. And that is what is ours. I mean, think about this, the desolation of generations, undoing curses of generations in family lines, of rebuilding things that have been lost. That is the power of the love of God activated in us and that we are able to release to the people as we minister to them. Ministering to others, letting our light shine, right? Sharing the Father's love. And I think so many times we overthink it. And we really just need to be obedient to what Holy Spirit's putting on our hearts. Just go with it. So as we prepared for this message, I had planned to share this neatly written little anecdote I had about an encounter at a produce market years ago. And it's a sweet story of God's love, his grace, and kindness of walking in love and how we don't ever really know how our actions will impact somebody. And this morning, we want to encourage everybody, all of us, to listen and to be obedient. And so as we were preparing I mentioned the produce market story to Rob, and he thought I was talking about a different encounter I'd had about 20 years ago. And as we read through our message yesterday, I realized Holy Spirit was saying, nope, not the produce market story, but it was this other encounter, one I'd almost forgotten. It was one January night here in Michigan. And I pulled up to a gas station, and I knew that I was supposed to give somebody there money. When I looked in my purse, all I had was a $20 bill. Would have been easy, like the $5 one. And at that point, $20 seemed like a lot of money to come out of our budget. So as I was filling up my car, using my credit card. That was when $20, that was when $20 could fill your tank. <laughs> A truck pulled up. He was across, they were across from me, and I was nearly choking on the fumes that were just chugging out of this truck. The back of the truck was full of stuff. The gas cap had been replaced with this old rag, and they 
were looking for something to put under their wheel because they weren't going to shut off the truck because they were afraid if they did, they wouldn't get it started again. And just like, I just wanted to leave. So I finished filling up my car, got in my car, looked at my wallet, turned on my ignition, and I left. And as I was pulling out of that parking lot, I knew. I knew I was being disobedient to my Lord. And I knew I had to go back. So I drove around, turned around, came back in, and pulled up next to that puffing, chugging truck and the two precious people that were there. I stumbled over my words, telling them that God had told me to give them money, and I didn't. And when I left, I knew I had to obey. Because you see, I love Jesus, I told them, and I want to obey him because I love him. So I gave the man the money. He went in the gas station to pay, and when he did, I had the opportunity to spend some time talking with the lady. She was in the cab. But see, It was about the money that was my test of obedience, but the money was the door for me to minister to this lady who was hurting. She was hurting physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So I got to pray for her, for her health problems. And then she told me about her uncle, who was a preacher, and she knew they were praying for them. So I got to spend some time ministering to her, encouraging her, And then I got to pray for her, for the things of her heart. And then the guy finished pumping gas, and he started scrambling around the back of his truck looking for something. And he said he wanted to thank me and give me a picture that he'd drawn. It was a picture of a cross because, you see, he too had had some connection in the past with Jesus. So he very carefully took this picture out of this overfull back of his truck, And he got a Sharpie, and he signed it. I still have the picture in my own box, reminding me of a time when I was almost disobedient. But God. But God. You see, there's a call-up today. There's a call-up in this season. A call-up to listen and to obey the voice of Holy Spirit, to obey the voice of the Father who is wanting us to share this love. He gave this love, but then he gave it up to us to introduce him and his love to everybody else. So where are you this morning? In a little bit, we're going to take communion, and you will have the opportunity to respond to that. Where are you this morning? Are you in a place where receiving the Father's love seems distant and far away? Maybe you think, my life's okay without it today. I I really, I'm fine. Maybe you're resistant because of something. You aren't ready to go back to the Father's house. I would say to you in all love this morning, you need to come to your senses. Like that son, you need to recognize the situation and that there is more for you in the presence of the Father. You need to come to your senses. Maybe this morning you are receiving the Father's love. You are in that place. Well, that love needs to be activated more so than it is. It should look like the Father's love in this story. And I'll even... This, uh, the prodigal son, there are several parables, stories there together. And one of them is the story of, it's referred to as the story of the lost sheep, where a sheep is lost. And, and so the shepherd goes looking 
And that's part of the love of the father. I know in this story, the, the father is kind of sitting, waiting, watching. But we need to be looking for those that are lost. Our eyes need to be like the eyes of the father, roaming, looking for those and going and seeking them out. And when there are those whose hearts have turned to the father, we need to be like the father in the story, running to meet them. We, we know from the story, kind of, and as I talked about the post on social media, the father was aware of what was going on with his son. But it didn't matter where he had been, what he had posted, what his lifestyle was, who he had voted for, what his political views were. The father went running because he was home. And we need to be running. We don't need to be obstacles to those that are coming to receive the Father's love. We need to be welcoming them in. We need to be rejoicing and celebrating with them as they come in. So that's the call that the Lord has placed on my heart to share with you this morning. If you're like the son, you need to come to your senses. If you're like the father, you need to be out there looking and finding and seeking and bringing people in and celebrating with them when they return. Yeah, amen. So if the ushers would go ahead and pass out um, the elements. While they're doing so, I'd like to encourage all of us to take a few minutes in examining our hearts, you know, the Apostle Paul talked about examining ourselves before taking the bread and drinking the cup. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will reveal to us, Holy Spirit, those things maybe we've been struggling with you about. Maybe there have been times that we knew that we knew we were supposed to obey. We didn't. James 4.17 says, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. So as we're praying today, as we're receiving communion, I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul said, I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. And um, I, I feel like there are people in here who really want to step out, who have sometimes heard Holy Spirit say, do this, say this. But maybe it just seemed big. And I know there's grace and he forgives. The Holy Spirit has also empowered us in boldness. And I'd like, I feel like the Lord has said I'm to pray to release a holy boldness. And if at the end you want me to lay hands on you to pray, I will. But I just, if you want to agree where you are, even as I pray about, lead us in prayer about that. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. And he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So let's take the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Thank you for leaving heaven and coming to earth as a little baby to a young couple 
to walk this earth to make us right in your sight, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We worship you and we praise you and we thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We love you and we say that there is no one like you. There is no one above you. There's no one beside you. There's no one like you, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you have given us Holy Spirit. He's our comforter. He's also the one who emboldens us and empowers us to go and to share your message of love with this hurting world. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I release a spirit of boldness over each and every one who is willing to receive. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I say that we are his voices. We are his people. We are his glory carriers. And I thank you, Lord, for those that you are wanting to bring into your fold, those that you have told us to go out and find, those that you bring across our paths. And I thank you, Lord, that you are glorified in Jesus' name.